Good evening, everyone. I begin this evening by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I thank the people for the care and respect for their land. My name is Tani Fitzgerald, and I'm the head of school, humanities and social sciences at La Trobe University. On behalf of the university, I welcome you to this fifth event for the Bold Thinking series 2016, Has Facebook Killed the News? Tonight, we hear from a panel of experts about the blurry business of information, entertainment, and click bait journalism in what promises to be a fascinating conversation. I'm proud to say that La Trobe is one of Australia's leading universities for journalism and communications. Tonight's discussion in particular will consider the role of journalists, marketers, and public relations in the Facebook era. On tonight's panel, we have Hugh Martin, who lectures in journalism in the Department of Communications and Media at La Trobe University, where he coordinates the Master of Communication Journalism Innovation Program. Formerly a digital editor and publisher for 15 years with Fairfax Media, News Corp Australia, and APN News and Media. He received a Walkley Award in 2004 and is the winner of two Melbourne Press Club Awards. In 2014, he was the recipient of the Walkley Foundation Grant for Innovation in Journalism. We also have Mark Civitella. Mark lectures at La Trobe University on social media use in political communication. He has spent over 20 years commentating on media and politics and specialises in political and issues communication. As a consultant, he has advised on a diverse range of matters from the waterfront dispute for the ACTU through to political policy and election campaigns. Joining Hugh Martin and Mark Civitella is Jane Caro. Jane is an author, novelist, lecturer, mentor, social commentator, columnist, workshop facilitator, speaker, broadcaster, and award-winning advertising writer. She is a regular guest on the ABC's Gruen Transfer. The common thread running through Jane's career is a delight in words and a talent for using them to connect with other people. Today, she runs her own communications consultancy and remains in high demand by advertising agencies as an award-winning freelance writer. I will now hand over to tonight's host, radio personality, Francis Leach. Please join with me in welcoming tonight's panel. Thank you all for being here. I was reflecting on uh, the film I saw yesterday, I went and saw the Beatles' new film, the Ron Howard film, Eight Days a Week, and it reminded me of a really important news moment in my life. It was uh, the day that John Lennon was shot, and I was at that stage just a 12-year-old kid, and the Herald, as it was then, the evening newspaper in Melbourne had turned up at home, and uh, they used to have, when the paper was going out at the last minute and they wanted last-minute news to arrive, it was a red-embossed little box in the corner that said, Lennon shot and it told you that he'd been shot and that there was obviously something bad happening. Uh, we had to wait till the television news a couple of hours later to really find out and turn the radio on and try and find out. And it just made me think that if that had happened yesterday, it would have been instantly filmed on someone's phone and beamed around the world in seconds and people would have been reporting from on the spot. Uh, we would have had eyewitness accounts uh, being seen by millions within a heartbeat of that murder taking place. Such is the way that news has changed. For good and probably also for worse as well. And that's part of what we're going to be debating here tonight. But with our panel, I wanted to start by asking the, 
fundamental question about what news they actually read, listen to and consume. So I'll start at the end there. Mark, if you had to describe what your news diet was, what are you reading and where are you getting it from? Oh, thank you for the diet question, uh, Mr. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I consume more than most. In fact, I was thinking about this, um, which is a good thing to do before you appear on one of these, <laughs> And I thought, I'm probably spending four times as much money on information services as I do on video streaming, which isn't good for my kids, but um, I actually consume, um, I subscribe to The Australian, um, The Age, I read The Guardian, I read everything else, and I get lots of feeds coming through various things. I probably spend, considering it's my occupation as well, consuming quite a lot more than anyone else. So you're the guy that actually gets behind the paywall. Well done, you. <laughs> I, I, yeah, and you can get invited to things you don't go to. It's fantastic. But, um, but it's... Um, look, and that is, I, I, I'm sort of happy to pay because I value information. Um, but I'm the odd one out. And, in fact, if you look at the data that's just come out, in fact, it fell from 21% to 17% of people, homes, families that are paying for um, news. So I'm now one of the absolute minority. But I'm, I'm quite happy... Hugh, yeah, what about you? What's, what's your news diet like? Um, all of that as well. I guess I think it's worth saying that um, as professionals, we probably feel an ob obligation as much as anything else to pay. I think there's many ways of getting around these things, but that's, that's really um, undermining the whole, the whole business of the industry we're in. So definitely um, Melbourne uh, papers and Melbourne websites, but I love the fact that we can now look at the New York Times and the Atlantic Monthly and the BBC Online and all of these wonderful international uh, news sites and, and get a real perspective of the, of the world and what's going on any day and any time of the day directly from the source, uh, from, the, from very, very much immediate sources. So I try to mix up uh, local news with, with the brands and the sites that we know uh, from, from our hometowns with a lot of great international news, and that consumes a lot of the time in the day, but that's, uh, that's, where we, we, that's what we do. And I think also that I do get a lot of news through Facebook, and I know we're going to get to that in a little while, but there is a, that is a major source of news for me too. Jane, there's so much out there. What are you choosing? Um, well, I maybe it's my advertising background, but I try to act like a consumer, and so... Um, I won't read The Australian, sorry. I just won't. Um, There's enough bad fiction in the world already, is that what well, you're saying? Well, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I, I used to read it and I know a bit about education and I read what they wrote and I thought, well, this is nonsense, so I'm, I have to assume everything else is. Uh, so I read the Sydney Morning Herald, um, but the first news source I go to, I'm based in Sydney, uh, first news I, saw, I go to in the morning is Twitter. Um, probably Facebook, then the Sydney Morning Herald. I listen to Radio National, so I get a lot of my news still from the radio. Uh, and in the evenings, I'm likely to watch The Drum. And I usually watch the ABC News, 7.30 Report, Q&A. Um, if I don't watch it on Monday night, I'll um, I view it, catch it up later. Uh, so, and the thing about the way I get news... And I subscribe to the Saturday paper, crikey, um, things like that. <clears throat> but I think the thing about the way I get news is I've noticed that online I read a lot less than I do when I have an actual paper newspaper in front of me. There's more serendipitous reading when I'm just turning the pages of a newspaper. Um, I get the newspaper in tangible form as well as online. Um, yes. Newspapers love me, I'm that kind of subscriber. But I also get most of my news, I think, collated for me by the people I follow on Twitter and Facebook, who, uh, over years, I found who sends the really good articles and who always has stuff I want to read. And those are the people that I follow. And so I would pick up news from all over the world and all over the place via the people I follow on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, I want to talk to you about how you can curate your own news a little later on. But before we do that, I do want to ask a philosophical question. Given the amounts, a volume of information and news that's available, uh, what is the function of quality news culture these days? What would you describe if you had an, ideal, an idealised version of what the news should be, given that everything that's out there, what should it be doing for us? I'd 
I, I don't think it exists, which is the difficulty. I think you have to... The news is dead, in that sense. Well, I think what you've got is you have different interpretations of what's going on. And it's up to you to really expose yourself to all the options and, and, and views that are available. Ultimately, you, I think, have to make up your own mind. And I suppose part of this is, and part of news is someone interpreting something to give you a sense of coherence. That yes, something's happened, I understand it because someone's interpreted it for me. Um, so I will find people that I think match what I want. And that's the difficulty is I tend to sort of um, re self-replicate uh, the things I'm interested in. So my, um, my shameful subscription to The Australian, of course, <laughs> is um, for a living, and I've been, I suppose, a political consultant for 20 years, is I have to know what everyone's thinking. And particularly for people that um, I've spent a lot of time looking at focus groups and things like that for a living. And um, yeah. Um, you know, what I do is so different to the average person, I have to realise that I'm, I have to rely on other mediums and what other people are reading to make a, a proper judgement. So I don't think there's any one great source of truth. There's just multiple contested realities out there about what's true. But is that tsunami of information now come at a cost of some sense of empirical truth in the news? Are facts now irrelevant? Because of that? No, not at all. Contested not realities. No. Where we can see the same four glasses on, on the table there, but we'll have 500 people tell us they're in different spots. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in there are facts. There, there is, is verifiable information. Uh, and yes, we can argue about, about perspectives and, and all of those kind of things in terms of analysis or um, uh, you know, interpretation, but... Um, you know, a, a good reporter reports what happened. And in terms of news, I mean, I think the ABC is a, is a terrific a source of factually reported news. Um, I find it amusing that there is um, constant accusations of bias against, a factual, against factually reported news. So, um, you know, that's a, certainly a place I go to to find out what's happened. But I think your question about what we, um, what we look for in terms of um, uh, explanation and uh, insights and, and background is a good one because that goes to trust. So we, we, we start to think about, well, who do we trust to give us a perspective that we are confident in, that we believe um, provides a better view or a, better, a more illuminating view on the world that we live in? And those, I think, are the challenges for quality media, is to build that trust with the broadest possible audience you can. Which is interesting, Jane, because traditionally there was a patriarchal structure, wasn't there? There was a so-called quality journalism. You're using the past tense. I'm not at all sure why. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but in this context, there were a number of... Co consider quality journalism institutions and the news was delivered almost in a me mechanical, unilateral fashion. Well, newspapers and television would print and broadcast material and uh, we would accept on face value or at least we would have a compact with whichever news service we believed in that they were telling us the truth. Now everyone can deliver the news and therefore we don't know maybe who to trust anymore. Is, it, is that necessarily a bad thing or is it up to the reader now? Has it empowered the reader, listener... Uh, or, or content uh, consumer to make more informed choices? Well, I, I think it's better now, oddly enough, but I don't know that it's dividable into good or bad. I think, you know, there is there are things that have improved and things that have gotten worse. OK, go through the good ones and then the bad ones. OK, well, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about patriarchy. I mean, when I was young, uh, the sources of information were very limited. They were totally white male dominated. That's the news you got. And in fact, if you um, were a female journalist or writer of any kind and you wanted to write stuff, this is right up till the 90s, um, you would pitch stories and they would say, oh, we had a story about women last month. Women have been done. <laughs> You know, it's not interesting to our readers. So you could, actually, there were gates, and they were about what interested the people who were in charge of information. So it wasn't unbiased and objective. It was incredibly biased and subjective. And one of the things that I've absolutely delighted in with um, social media is how it has completely blown that view of what's important and what's unimportant out of the water. I mean, the thing that has taken off on social media 
are the voices of people who were never heard before. Feminisms come roaring back onto the agenda uh, because women started writing about what interested them without having to go cap in hand with their copy to some old bloke and say, can you publish this? Uh, they just put it up there and lo and behold, what is the, you know, what is everyone scrambling to catch up with? The women's media because it's got the readership, it's got, you know, huge traction because we were starving for it. We'd been starving for it for centuries. I mean, it really fascinates me that the women of India are up in arms about the rapes in that country. There's nothing new about rape in India. What's new is that everybody's got a smartphone, even the poorest of the poor, and women are able to say, I'm absolutely shocked about what just happened to one another, and go, me too, let's march in the streets. Whereas 20 years ago, they said in their family, if you heard what happened, it's really terrible. And their husband said to them, it's not our business. You don't get involved in that. And they were kept separate and they couldn't get together. Now they're holding the police to account. They're holding the government to account. They're a powerful force. I think this is an entirely wonderful thing. I think the fact that we're hearing LGBTI um, voices in the way that we are now is exactly the same. They've been able to escape from the no one's interested in what you have to say. Now, of course, there's all sorts of rubbish out there as well. That's fine. I don't know about you, but I like a bit of rubbish in my life. I don't necessarily want everything I read to be deep, meaningful, deadly, serious politics. I don't want everything I read to be absolute frivolous crap either. I like a little bit of both. But is there a danger, though? I know we're seeing this in the United States now in the current election, election cycle, that uh, a lie once repeated becomes a truth that's hard to shift. And given the multiplicity of voices screaming a chorus of lies, it's hard to wedge the truth in there somewhere. So sometimes that multiplicity of voices becomes a real problem in the, in the civic discourse, doesn't it? Well, I think it does because people believe it. And um, the, the difficulty is, ultimately, is there's an interpretation of what's going on and there's contested belief and a contested reality, and I, I disagree with you on that one. There are some simple facts like that, but any complex thing that occurs creates complex interpretations. Um, when I say complex, I'm not referring to Donald Trump's comments on it in any way. <laughs> They're quite the opposite of complex. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the person who invented Twitter should be shot uh, just right now. I think that's something we'd agree with, given Donald's use of it. But um, when you look at, I mean, at my life, in a way, and I think Graham Richardson once said it, um, which is, no matter how hard a journalist pushes their nose up against the window, they're not in the room. And I've sort of spent 20 years in the room. And then I'll read something about what happened or what transpired or what deal was done or something like that, and it's not true. So even the best journalists and the highest quality, people I, I read now and respect, I, and it's not their fault, they just don't have access to it. So I think you're still left with that contested space because you know, so much is now controlled and protected and it's extremely difficult for journalists now because there just aren't enough of them. And it's that sort of, that absolute 1% of journalism, and we talk about is journalism dead as a result. That 1% of journalism is that sort of thin line between us doing well and going over the edge because the, the, you know, if someone isn't shining a light somewhere on a particular activity, that activity may not be illegal, but it may be wrong, maybe morally wrong. If people aren't doing that, we don't have people doing that, then I don't know what uh, our future scenario is. We absolutely need some mechanism there, but I just bear, in, bear the consideration that it's impossible for them to gain those facts. I think we, we, we run the risk of, of falling into category errors when we start talking about what is, um, you know, what is news and what is, what, is, what is journalism. Journalism is many, many things. And we have news reporting in this country which is factually correct and very good. We also have a lot of commentary which mas masquerades as news reporting, which is in the, ca is in the category of contestable um, uh, information. And there's no question about that, because a lot of political reporting is on second-hand information, and it's he said, she said stuff. But, but we, do, we, do need to, we do need to be clear on what, is, what, is, what we're talking about. And I think that, um, that the whole issue of, of social media and the noise that we get on social media about opinions 
isn't really journalism. It's shouting in a pub. And it's, you know, the loudest, loudest voice uh, will always win. But there'll be someone sitting in the corner knowing that this isn't, you know, what they're hearing is nonsense. And they'll, they'll be able to, to spread their view in a different way. But and is I'm, anyone listening if everyone's shouting? Yes, lots of people lots are listening. People listening. And the shout loudest voice does not always win. Give us an example. Well, I think, um, for example, I, I love Twitter and I, I don't want the inventor of Twitter shot. Um, in fact, I think the inventor of Twitter has done something really remarkable. And I think the thing about Trump's use of Twitter is it's revealing him. And there aren't a, lot of, there aren't a whole lot of people who think Trump's use of Twitter, who are on Twitter, is, is particularly clever or, or admirable in any way. And in fact, people may make their um, decisions about who to vote for for all sorts of crazy reasons, but I don't think it's got to do with the fact that Twitter is somehow presenting Donald Trump as some kind of hero. I don't think that's true. And I think what you have to... What I've noticed winning on, on um, social media, and particularly on Twitter, which is a big kind of melange of a whole lot of ideas and voices and points of view, is the people who seem to get the most kind of respect and followers are those who calmly and quietly state the point of view, have facts to back it up. They're actually the people who do well. If you're a screamer on Twitter, you get blocked. You get shut off. Nobody listens. Um, I mean, I use the block um, thing on Twitter with monotonous regularity. Do you get a lot of pleasure Great. out of doing that? I do. It's, <laughs> it's gleeful. Blockity block, block, block. Um, love it. I'm going to get into that. That sounds like yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, people are uh, hesitant to block. I can't imagine why. Um, I, my rules are this. If you're abusive, you get blocked. If you're rude, you get blocked. If you're dreary, you get blocked. If you're creepy, you get blocked. Um, you know, it's easy. It's you an exclusive club being on Twitter with you. <laughs> no, no, no. Most people are not like that. <laughs> It's interesting, though, the technology then starts to dictate to us. There's no doubt about it. So increasingly, I read a survey just the other day that over 60% of people now, of millennials as they call them, now get their news almost predominantly through four or five phone apps like Facebook, Snapchat and a few others. So while they're accessing that information, there's also a reciprocation going on where they're providing information to those social media companies who are then curating a news feed that they choose to deliver through algorithms that might reflect a worldview that they're already partial to. Mm. How is that healthy? Well, it's, I don't think it's particularly healthy, but I also don't think they're particularly accurate. If what they put on my news feed is any indication, <laughs> I think they mostly go on my age. Because a lot of the stuff I get is about retirement and things like that. But my most usual message is now about getting rid of unwanted belly fat. Now, <laughs> it is true, I would like to get rid of some unwanted belly fat. But I've never searched for it. It's, they're just going on my age. So they're still using very blunt instruments. I know they keep telling advertisers they've got all this amazing, sophisticated stuff. But I've got a horrible feeling if what I'm seeing is accurate. But that's prize bullshit. It's a bit of a myth. But it does feel that people are retiring, does it not, due to their respective camps and, sh camps and shouting over a wall at each other. Uh, if you look at people's Facebook pages where they get into a community of people who share the same views and they ramp up their rhetoric, if you look at comment sections on newspapers and whatnot, it's hardly a, a, a civic exchange, is it, between competing ideas anymore? I think there's, a, <clears throat> there's definitely a, a, a risk that... Uh, we're feeding into entrenched positions from political uh, points of view. And I think Q&A in, in itself is probably an example writ large on TV of that. It's a, it's a representation of that dynamic, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so I think that you know, those whole idea of filter bubbles where you're really only hearing ideas and hearing um, information that you already agree with because the networks that you're attached to are feeding that to you isn't, isn't healthy. But there's, <coughs> there's the challenge, is, is how, do we, how do we, A... Be, be aware of that and be transcended somehow. And there are means and ways of doing that. Social media isn't a place where you can't, you can't navigate your way to information that is, uh, that is new and fresh and challenging. But to be perfectly frank with you, coming out of the advertising industry, the one thing I know, and I mean, Hugh Mackay's written a lot of stuff about this, is that people, this is normal human beings, have a box in their head of ideas that they believe and agree with. And other ideas bounce off it. So if you give people information that is contrary to their deeply held beliefs, however rationally and however much evidence you have, it's highly likely that it's just ignored. And that's not new. 
That's always been like that. Absolutely right. I mean, I probably would classify myself as a fairly contrary person, so I quite like that, um, that, that argumentative position and I'll happily go looking for it. But I know that a lot of people aren't like that. I know that. And we see that played out on, uh, in social media every day. We see people agreeing with each other, shouting a bit louder, saying the same things. One of the rules we had uh, when we were moder when I was working at The Age online and we moderated um, comments was, and this is something that happens everywhere in, on all news sites, is if the comment doesn't add something, if it's a me too comment, it doesn't get, doesn't get through. There's no point in having a whole, you know, a whole list of, of people all saying the same thing. You look for a little bit of, of opposition, a little bit of challenge. I'm a bit shocked though, because the competition of ideas, the notion of critical thinking is supposed to be central to a public debate in the public interest, isn't it? Or is the public interest a load of crap? I, I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't think, I mean, Jane's point's right. In fact, there's some fantastic studies in the US that show that people may believe something. It's actually empirically wrong. They're then given the correct information and it actually reconfirms right. and hardens their original view. I'd be like President Obama's birth certificate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, mm, that's yeah. it. Um, and that is, that is one of the... Um, that is one of the difficulties um, in communication is you, how do you um, have uh, a diverse conversation? How do you get people to change their mind about an entrenched view when you, you have um, features like this happening? And the other point, just to go back on, I mean, I, I, what I would differ is the algorithms are getting better and better and better, and certainly some of the things I've seen which even do the geolocations and actually suck other data out of the internet and social media use and the profiling and so on. And certainly I've even seen this used in, um, in profiling for propensity to engage in terrorism, you know. Um, and that these are really big investments in this sort of technology. So every time you're reading something, you're giving something a little bit of something away from about yourself, aren't you? Well, the, that's the interesting thing because everyone thinks it's free. Google's free, um, Facebook's free. It's not. What people don't realise is you're the product. You're the one being sold to the advertiser, and you're giving all this stuff away. You, you're not in control. You're the product, and um, that's the bit that possibly people don't see as much. And in many circumstances, you know, you're bundled up as part of a service for a particular campaign. I mean, you know, that's what happens. It's never, it's always been like that though. Every time people mm. filled in a coupon and sent it off, <laughs> exactly the same thing happened. Yeah. Flybys when you swipe your yeah, card at, yeah. at the supermarket. But, but back to old cutting out a coupon and sending <laughs> off for a special price in supermarket, all data kept. But I. Mark, I was reading before also about Facebook's news trend team. Tell people about that because that was an interesting experiment that they ditched. So Facebook has this philosophical dilemma going on. It doesn't want to be seen as a publisher because if it's seen as a publisher, then it's seen as responsible for the editorial content that goes out there. What it wants to be is a conduit to whatever the hell you want to say. But they did flirt with it, didn't they? And then they walked away from it. Yeah, I think they walked away from it wisely. Um, Tell people what it was. Oh, Hugh's probably oh, sorry, Hugh, better yeah, for yeah. Uh, that sort of area. Yeah. But, uh. Well, they, uh, Facebook have had a team of people, uh, about a dozen or so people in one of their offices in the States, uh, working on that trending list of news, um, news topics that you see on the right-hand side of your um, Facebook feed to help collate the top stories and to filter out uh, things that would be not classified as news. They, um, they removed them about a month or so ago and allowed the algorithm to do all of the work to collate those, um, those trending topics. And they discovered pretty quickly that the algorithm actually doesn't work as well as, the, uh, as, well as they thought it did, and it started putting back in those, those things which were clearly not important news, but nevertheless a lot of people were clicking on, so whether it's cat videos or, uh, or, or things like that. So th I think there's a balance. I think there's, there's an issue that, that Facebook do have to deal with, and, and the other related issue here is they, earlier this year, decided to downgrade news headlines from news publishers to replace, to try and get rid of clickbait, basically. So there was a trend up until uh, recently of news um, publishers writing um, 
headlines like, um, I was amazed and then I found out this, click, click, you know, click on this, on this link, or you'll never believe what happened. And, you know, we've all seen them and they're, they're all, they often lead to very disappointing news articles. But the, the belly of fat, I think, is the... Possibly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So their, their, their attempt was to try and downgrade those headlines and replace them with information about people you know, pe information that's coming from your friends. The, the, the result was that publishers were outraged and complained very loudly to Facebook because they've invested a lot of money in being part of the Facebook ecosystem. That has been quietly dialled down now by Facebook and we're starting to see headlines back again. So we're, we, we're, we're in a, I think we're in, a, in a quite a fluid environment in relation to, to Facebook and news publishing. And it's got a long way to play out. You're right that they are, they are a publisher and Mark Zuckerberg is probably the most powerful editor in the world at the moment, even though he won't admit it. But they've got legal issues that they won't want to be exposed to, which they've seen Google get exposed to. Because Google's effectively been doing this for, for you know, a decade now. And they've had major litigation issues in US and Europe and it's cost them a huge amount of money. And Fairfa um, Fairfax, uh, Facebook is, is very, obviously very keen to avoid the same. Should Facebook have an editorial policy then? I mean, if it, if, it, if it doesn't and it wants to be an open information exchange and it puts up anti-halal uh, pages and, and a whole range of misinformation around a whole lot of extreme views, are we OK with that as a, as a price that we pay in order to read what we want to read? It's a very interesting question because if Facebook and Twitter decide, and I think Twitter is starting to decide to take on the whole trolling thing and uh, starting to get much more active in terms of... Uh, banning forever people who threaten to kill people and all that sort of stuff. So it is starting to happen. But the trouble is, I, I think in a way, it's sort of the horse has bolted. I mean, there's anyone who wants to write terrible things on the internet can do it. Uh, they don't have to do it via uh, Facebook and Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or uh, all those uh, mechanisms. So uh, the thing is, the dark side of it isn't going to go away. Mm. Um, it's always going to be there and it's whether we look at it uh, or get rid of it. I mean, I, don't, I, I would hate to be making those decisions. I think it's a really complex area because I think we're at the infancy, in fact, of what's happening with the internet and with, with the way it's being used altogether. Um, we're, and we don't know what it's best at and worst at. And so it's all experimentation at the moment. No one knows really where it's going to end up and anyone who tells you they do is lying to you, usually wanting money. Um, it, 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 people are, and Facebook are experimenting and Twitter are experimenting. They don't know any better than anyone else. But there are some very good groups coming through and one our department has supported quite a bit, like the Online Hate Prevention Institute, um, where a group of people get together and try and fund you know, basically um, looking at the trolling, looking at uh, anti-Semitic in the first instance now, um, anti-Islamic, um, and half these things, you know, I think we should be doing jihad something or other, whatever. It's actually you, you know, some sort of, you know, angry, you know, white people, you know, doing <laughs> something that are not even Muslim, it's you know. Fantasy it's fantasy It's someone to set up a fake account, and, and of course they find them out, they contact, they hate them, shut down, and all the rest. But it's a constant um, process. Well, it's trying to put out a bushfire with a yeah. garden hose, really. Um, but at least there, there's, a, there's sort of organisations now which emerge, and they emerge organically out of this sort of chaos to try and, right. try and correct, you know, what is actually gross misrepresentations. But then there's things like revenge porn, I mean, which mm. is absolutely devastating. Um, and so it's weird, isn't it, because on one level this um, free-for-all has given women um, and other art groups uh, access to the public conversation really in an unmediated sense for the first time ever in history. Um, but at the same time, there's been an equal and opposite reaction where they have never been more vulnerable in terms of humiliation and exposure and intimidation and trolling and all of that. So, I mean, I don't have any solutions. There is, there's a danger, though, that's been identified. And I'll read this to you from media professor Emily Bell of Cambridge University in a great article she wrote about this. And she said, quote, We're handing the controls of important parts of our public and private lives to a very small number of people who are unelected and unaccountable. And I guess she's referring to the fact, though, everyone's on Facebook and it might look like it is a great big melting pot that we're now coalescing around, as we talked about before, maybe a handful in real terms of really powerful 
new media organisations who have the controls of that. And we're seeing governments being very interested in this. We saw the case with the San Bernardino, uh, San Bernardino shooters where the US government were very determined to try to get the key to unlock those iPhones and know how they could break into an iPhone. We, we, we've had Google and others push back against that sort of intervention. So are we in danger of uh, handing the keys to our, our public discourse, our privacy over to a small number of uh, organisations which are then going to in some sense be held, held uh, hostage by, by governments and sexual interests. But how is that different from how it was 20 years ago? How is it different? That then it was News Limited, Fairfax, you know, there were a few media organisations who controlled much more um, uh, because of the expense of putting anything out in the public arena than is now happening. The other side of that, um, though, Francis, is that with data being collected in such large quantities, often in centralised places, it is equally vulnerable to attack and, and hacking. So the Panama, Panama Papers um, uh, exposure that led to dozens, hundreds of, of incredibly um, uh, rich stories, the Edward Snowden case, um, uh, we've seen lots of small, smaller examples of the same thing, where data sets get, um, get, get uh, you know, distributed uh, by people who are perhaps not legally or certainly not officially um, uh, able to access them. And that then generates a whole lot of, of incredibly rich um, uh, media coverage. So, look, I don't know that that's a good thing in, it, in and of itself, but it certainly counterbalances some of the, the argument around um, there being mysterious, uh, you know, nefarious, shadowy figures who are, who are controlling our lives. We still have um, uh, ability to investigate this, and, to, and this is why, another reason why journalism is so important. We need strong, um, strong media outlets. We need people who are willing to, to um, you know, to risk their own personal safety sometimes to, to get stories to, to, the, to the rest of us. And that's hugely important. So for all of the danger, I'm with you, Jane, in terms of the power of uh, being empowered to, agri uh, to curate your own news. And I do as well through Twitter. I've had an extraordinary... I'll give you an example of, of how it works as a, as a working journalist and broadcaster. So last year I was on air the Saturday morning of the Paris attacks and I knew that I was having to cover a bunch of things and I knew that I could find someone who was at the, uh, at the Stade de France via Twitter. So I sent out a message to my list of football journalists and within I said, are you there and can I call you? And within... I think 30 seconds, I had five responses and phone calls from a Russian journalist, an Italian journalist and a couple of French people. And I had that person on air within two minutes, which as someone who worked in the age when no, the mobile phones didn't exist, it was extraordinarily powerful. And I could tell that story over and over again as a tool of journalism and, and working and trying to use that medium to connect with people. I've built networks all over the world with like-minded people who want to... I, I work for them, I do stuff for them and, and in a reciprocal arrangement arrangement have uh, been able to share information and news and, and our skill set to hopefully do something substantive. Mm. But you could see that model actually transposing out of any formal uh, relationship with the publisher. Mm. You could be setting up an international, the cheapest international news system uh, of, of trusted sources, <laughs> for instance, um, where you could create a fantastic system yourself. The old days, the cost barriers of the CNN constructions and all that, we had to be a billionaire to play, mm. uh, they're gone. Yeah. So that's the, that's the great thing about the polarity. That's the great thing about the opportunities and the, if you like, the total disruption of that space. Um, yes, it's, it's destroyed some good things <laughs> in its path, but it's created these other fantastic opportunities and particularly, as you mentioned, you know, LGBTI, women, there's this other people now with a freedom and a capacity to express themselves, which was shut off from before. And of course, a great commercial opportunity for you, Francis, which you should. <laughs> I'm too busy being here with you, Mark. <laughs> um, have you had similar experience with, with the use of social media to build those networks and, and to, to like grow an, in your own work an alliance of trusted sources? Oh, absolutely. And I've made friends and I've found, I mean, I've always been um, outspoken as a feminist in support of public education, but I, you know, I live a very um, low and offshore lady's life, so I often felt very isolated in those views. And it's been wonderful to find so many people, and uh, you know, we've been able to really nurture one another in our um, courage, I think, 
um, in fact, to get up and speak. In fact, as I was saying to you... Yeah, tell us that story about yeah. your experience with, with the article you wrote about Hillary Clinton. Yeah, it's, it's quite... We were talking about the American election, which obviously everyone's going to be doing more and more in the next few weeks. Um, and I was saying that I wrote a piece in... Uh, I've been a fan of Hillary Clinton for about 30 years, ever since she said, I'm no Tammy Wynette. Uh, and um, she was such a fresh voice. And so I wrote a piece... Um, very supportive of her. And whenever you write a piece about Hillary Clinton, particularly if you're a woman and it's saying she's a good person, you get absolutely slammed. Like, when the Bernie bros were out, they'd go you. Um, so you're getting it left and right, you know, the Trump supporters and um, the Bernie supporters. And so it was a little bit exhausting. And I wrote this piece and got slammed. And then I got invited, which really surprised me, to join a secret or a closed Facebook group for Hillary Clinton supporters. And the idea of this group was, it was all women, was that they could speak freely to one another without getting slammed and therefore get the courage to then go out and write the articles and support her and put comments on pages and do all of that kind of thing and know there was a safe place to retreat to. And I was fascinated by this. I thought, that's really... So I just Googled... Um, Hillary, you know, secret Hillary support groups closed, Hillary, what's silence, silent Hillary supporters. There was article after article after article after article talking about how supporters of Hillary Clinton, mostly women, often older women, who feel intimidated by the attack that they run. That attack, by the way, is designed to shut them up. Um, it has been, to some extent, successful. So, it, the, some of the articles had headlines like hiding in plain sight, the phenomenon of the silent Hillary supporter. I even read one article which said that the Hillary campaign have deliberately um, positions their campaign offices at the back of shopping centres so that people can go there without anyone knowing that they've gone. Um, and I thought this was really interesting that in this world of the vitriol which, I mean, women have disproportionately experienced that on social media. And, and in one way, that's a really good thing because it's what, what it's showing is that women are actually standing up and speaking out in a way they never have before. And that's why the threat of that is, you know, being greeted with such uh, fury. But it was so interesting to find that even women who were supporting Hillary Clinton had to sort of have safe spaces so that they could kind of lick their wounds and then go back out into battle. But what you're saying is beneath the white noise of all that craziness... There, is, there are a whole lot of people who just don't say out loud what they're going to do or what they think, but that doesn't stop them doing and thinking what they do and think. That's why those yelling people, the intimidators, actually fail, because they do exactly what you just said, by yelling and screaming and intimidating, they may silence, but actually they, they harden mm. the view of the person who feels they've been silenced. Mm. Uh, one interesting point you brought up earlier, and I want to get to this, is about the, the change in the voice in the media. And I guess the most, the most startling one of recent times was the uh, case of Philando Castile, who was shot in Minneapolis, I think it was, Minnesota. Uh, and his girlfriend... Lavish Reynolds filmed it live while it happened. Uh, it's just the most extraordinary citizen journalism in a way mm. that I think I've ever seen. And you would, and those voices would never be heard in that context, in that way, ever before in that situation. It would have been reported by someone standing in front of a camera with the, you know, with the, the, the shots in the distance and, and narrated by a third person. Uh, is citizen journalism going to save the news or is it going to kill the news because what it will do is destroy the, the, uh, the business model of it? Uh, well, that's a, that's a big question that kind of takes us... I just wanted to quickly add something to the, your first comment. That piece of, of journalism about the used Facebook Live was absolutely extraordinary, I agree with you. But it feeds into a broader um, uh, campaign, the hashtag Black Lives Matter um, campaign that's running in, in the States, and that we're seeing echoes of here. I've got a student in one of my classes who's written some really wonderful stuff on how the, hash, the Black Lives Matter campaign is also filtering through um, Maori activists in, and Pacific Island activists through uh, parts of um, uh, the Asia-Pacific and in certain parts of 
of Australia. And it's, it's really powerful. So I think, you know, to, to then segue into the second part of the question, citizen journalism is a fantastic resource and, and, and an opportunity for people who have these, these kind of um, issues to, to bring to a wider audience. And we've seen uh, a lot of examples over the years of how that works, not just from social media point of view, but be before the social media era, before 2007, uh, around um, blogging and various other um, types of, of online media. And, um, you know, the, the Middle East um, Arab Spring uh, campaigns that we saw from, you know, 2010, 2011, very similar things. So it's, it's women, it's minorities that are being oppressed, it's whole uh, countries that are, that, are, that are being oppressed that are able to use these, these channels and these platforms to reach audiences and to publicise their, their, their perspectives and their, their news in a way that's never been, never been possible before. And I think that's extraordinary. I think there's a... The downside of that, though, is um, probably the best users of social media in the world is probably Islamic State. And, um, you know, you, you look at what happened in the Arab Spring, and it ended in tears, but, <laughs> uh, you know, within two years, you know, they were beheading Westerners. And, in fact, the heads of Islamic State, they sort of just kept going because it was, you know, a YouTube thing. And, um, and um, they actually they said, you stop beheading Westerners because... Yeah, you but Mark, I've got to I'll just pull you up and say quickly that that started in the in the in the late 90s and the and the early 2000s, the first Iraq War. They were they were using yeah. um, online media before there was social media and before there was IS. So those extremists have certainly been very adept at using it. But they got they got better, and I think the thing better, with Islamic State is that they now yeah. actively recruit. Um, for exactly people with social media skills. So they do stuff with cats and all sorts of stuff now, um, I suppose. I've, I've so they've their own version of this. clickbait to, to recruit? They use, they use cat clickbait to get people in. <laughs> um, look, here we are, you know, we're doing this stuff with cats. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and it's, you know, because obviously they're old magazines and all the rest. I mean, they're, they're hard to distribute and all the rest. And people that download them are generally on a watch list. Mm. But, um, you know, and they um, are probably brilliant at, at this. And, and I think that's the difficulty is, yes, it's fantastic, and no, it's not. Um, but I suppose, in a way, the tool of media, whatever size or however it was constructed, has always been used for both good and evil. I mean, if you want to look at... Um, Nazi Germany and uh, Goebbels' machine and one voice constantly. There wasn't a multiplicity of voices. There were very few. And it was just as evil and just as... And in, in a way, it was monolithic and industrial and systematic and, and terrifying. So, I, I mean, I don't, I, I, keep, I don't think it's a good-bad. It's, a, you know, good things and bad things. Uh, yep. But I think, you know, interestingly enough, Goebbels' great model for his propaganda was Hollywood. Yes. Because it goes unnoticed. You don't know it's propaganda. The difficulty with Facebook is people don't know it's propaganda. They, they're just consuming the stuff they like. They don't actually realise that in many instances there are people, you know, architects of that communication. But that's also been, always been the case, hasn't it? Where you used to have to read a newspaper article and say, OK, it's been published by a certain newspaper which has a certain agenda, so I need to read it with a critical eye and make my own judgement about the values that are inherent in the text. Isn't that what intelligent people should always do? Oh, absolutely. But, but I think it also raises another question around education and how we choose to, to educate children and, and young adults in digital literacy. And it seems to me, Jane and I were talking about this earlier, that there's a, a, um, a, an opportunity for us to start building into um, literacy programs at a very early age. The, um, the critical faculties around using this kind of media that, that are necessary for, um, for, for, for living in the 21st century and for using media. Um, we do that in, a, in, in an old-fashioned, almost 19th century type of way still, uh, and, and that's got to be changed in order for, for people to be able to, be able to you know, pick I, these kind of problems. I, I would say that they're going to have to name the Institute after you, Hugh, but that, that is probably the one thing. What can you do to stop the abuse? What can you do to ensure that, you know, particularly, you know, at-risk people are unexpected? And, and it's going to have to be, because no one has a management of this, it's going to have to be how you, a training system, almost like civics, <laughs> because the new civics That was so space, successful you know, too, <laughs> civics as a school subject. The, the, new, the new space <laughs> is digital, yeah. you know, the new space is online. 
The trouble is you've got a teaching profession where the average age is 48 trying to tell a whole lot of digital natives how to do online and that's mm. a major problem. I think uh, I was talking to a young teacher, uh, female teacher, um, not that long ago, and she was saying to me that the biggest issue she deals with is when teaching adolescent boys is pornography and she said and the problem is no one's talking to them about it. No one's telling them that it's a performance, that it has nothing to do with actual real sex. There's no... And she said, and in schools, we can't because parents would be up in arms, governments would be up in arms, you'd have Lyle Shelton from the Christian lobby, you know, um, naming and shaming and all that kind of thing. She said, but actually, that is the sort of thing we should be talking to young people about because it's, you know, it's, it's actually part of their lives and they're just doing it on their own experiment with, with no, and they're not telling their parents and no one's talking to them about it. It's, it's a very, very good point. And I think that the, the dilemma, one of the dilemmas here is that um, the best education also has to be supported at home. So it's, it begins at home, it's, it's affirmed and it continues at home. So there's that continuity between, between school and home. But if you've got a, a, a parent or parents who don't understand this technology themselves, how can they do that? Exactly. So we need to, it needs to start somewhere, and it's, you know, it's a political issue as well as it is an education one. I'm, I'm We're going to take some of your calls. Uh, calls, as I'm still on the radio. <laughs> some of your in. questions. Get your iPhones yeah, out. Get them out. That'll be fun. I'll take your call. Uh, we'll take some of your questions in a moment, but I just want to finish with one question for the old media, for the survival of the old media. Jane, you still write for Fairfax, and uh, people uh, who ex are still expected to pay for it. Is there a future for media that people will pay for anymore? Yes. Yes. Um, I, uh, the one thing I, I, I think when I look at um, media is I can't think of a form of media that's ever died. What's, what has happened is Tell the land... Uh, yeah, but it's not really a media. It was a message sending. So, I, mean, I mean, you know, like mass media, mass media kind of thing. I've never, I've never... can't think of one that died. I mean, you know, <laughs> cinema was... I suppose silent movies died and... We got talkies, but it they evolved. were still movies. It evolved. And television was going to kill cinema and... Uh, Video was going to kill the radio yeah, stuff, but hey, we're still right. here. And we're still here. <laughs> and the internet was going to kill newspapers and magazines. And yes, it's made them all change and evolve. But it's like it gets blown up and it all settles down and people and think they find what they can do. I mean, radio's had a resurgence, really, because of podcasting and how much people find that to be something they can do when they're driving or they're working on the computer or whatever. And can curate their own once again. Again, they're Correct. They're able to decide what they want to listen to. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think people will still subscribe to things. People will still buy magazines. They'll also devour stuff online. We will just kind of find out what we like. And then yes. some, some other invention will come along and blow all that out of the water. Yeah, there's no demand problem. There's no lack of demand for media. It's a business model issue. And I, my, my argument here is that, um, uh, that, that newspapers particularly had a a historically um, outlier -ish, um, period of time from the 70s through to the late 90s where they were getting profit margins of 30 plus percent and that's not a standard kind of um, industry uh, average. It's more like 12 to 16 percent. So it's coming down. So newspapers have kind of got to learn to live in, in the same kind of profit margins that other industries are, are, are living in. Yeah. Um, and if they can do that, they'll be around. And it's trust. If you can maintain your trust with your audience at the same time, no reason why they won't continue. Well, Mark's doing his, but he's subscribed to the Australian, so he's uh, he's. But I, trust is very else. important to him. But I don't <laughs> read the editorials. So <laughs> I know. The, uh, but but on that, I think it's uh, there, there is more consumption and more contribution than ever before. So we're actually consuming more. We're actually so I think there's a there's a really positive sense around news. I just think the difficulty is trust, and a lot of the traditional news isn't as trusted as say a friend. Uh, in social media, and um, yeah, but I, I can't see it. There'd almost need to be an intervention if traditional investigative news journalism was at risk, because it, there, there's too much at stake for for, for the, the health of a society. I mean, and I say that from someone who's generally been on the other side of it. I mean, because there's actually certain things a society needs. If not, we tip over the edge. It gets really nasty, and I think that's one thing. How that works. I don't know. Well, over to you now. If you've got a question for any of our panellists, we've got a couple of microphones uh, running around. There's a question. Uh, yeah, go first. Um, 
I have a theory that um, quality journalism only arose because newspapers were making heaps and heaps and heaps of money. They could afford to fund quality journalism. It takes time, it takes resources, it takes people to be involved in that for a long, long time. My concern is that as the profit margins in newspapers in particular um, become wafer, wafer thin, newspapers won't be able to afford to do that same sort of quality journalism and we will be missing out on a whole lot of um, vital political discourse um, that helps our democracy function. To yeah. put it sort of um, plain terms. I think that I would, I would actually, um, I'd be quite, you know, I mean, I'm even willing to subscribe to the Australian, so there's money is no object. But uh, I think there's almost a need to have something like a fair work ombudsman and so on, these things that go off and investigate and report and are accountable to the public. Uh, that some, they're independent of government and so on. And, and if the entire newspaper model failed, if you like, or the, the quality news model failed, there's almost a need for a, a body to, to take up that and to basically do what um, uh, new, good quality news journalism does. Or an ABC that a government doesn't interfere in? That's what I was well, going to say. We already well, have a model, which yeah, is one, a public broadcaster. Yeah, the, dif the difficulty is there's, it, it, it doesn't have enough arm's length from government. Well, that's because it's under attack from government, because yeah. it's done exactly. Can you I have a quick answer, Gordon? Go at Gordon's question as well. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of where it's come from. But do you think also that there's a necessity for newspapers like The Age, and you know, we both had some experience there, um, to make priorities and, and change priorities? So perhaps in an issue where news is commodified, where the, the actual daily, day-to-day -day factual information is, is everywhere, that the, the available resources need to be corralled for investigations and for bigger, bigger uh, pieces. Uh, so can I respond to that, actually? Yeah. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. But what if your news values become determined by what people will click on and only by what people will click on? People don't click on political stories. Any commercial TV um, um, news director will tell you as soon as they put a political story on air, people switch off. Well, well, well from, sorry, from their audience. And I think the research has been done. It says something like it's only 5% of the population that is engaged in following politics in a deep sort of way all the time. That rises to about 20% when an election is approaching. So there's a very small market for that sort of material. And if it is that small and, and profits are diminished that much that they can't put the resources into this. And it's also, and don't get a from the, my experience of people who do this sort of work, and we had um, Nick McKenzie on our last panel, I had a good chat with him, and he was just about to file a story which required him not only to write the story but to record a, uh, a video piece and do a whole range of other multimedia aspects to it which ate into his time, but because of the demands of the many platforms uh, he had to deliver it on, his workload had increased exponentially. He was absolutely exhausted by it. I, I think we are going through this period of flux where people don't know how to handle this but I mean if you're going to maintain your brand in a in an increasingly competitive marketplace and that's basically what's happening it, you know there's a huge explosion of competition for eyeballs um, for everything you, you know yeah you, you have to offer something and one of the things that an organization like Fairfax for example and the ABC has whether they've depleted it to some extent or not is arguable. I think they have. But what they have is actually a reputation built up over um, a very long period of time of being a trustworthy source and of being high quality. Now, they trashed that completely at their peril because they're not going to be able to compete against the tabloids and the Facebooks and the uh, crappy. They'll never, they'll never win in that space. They'll just lose. And I think they're starting to work that out. I mean, if you look what's been happening uh, on uh, television drama, for example, uh, in comparison to movies, television, the quality of television drama has gone through the roof. Um, and yet you wouldn't think that that would happen in such an incredibly competitive environment. So I, I haven't given up hope. Good. I've had my say. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think that's a good point, Jane. And, and, and it, it also pushes the, the, the pressure back on those organisations to rethink what it is that they do. And I think it's not just newspapers. I mean, radio is having an a, a, a interesting time at the moment. But old-fashioned linear radio isn't going to last. It has to go... When it goes, goes digital, it has to go into a different format. And that's got to be thought through. So newspapers may end up being very beautifully designed weekend print products that people will pay a premium 
premium for, where the investigations are, 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 are allowed to flourish. But Monday to Friday online, it's something else. Who yeah, knows? I think that's probably what will happen. Some more questions. I think we've got a question down the front, then we'll come to you as well. Um, I'm David. I used to work for the BBC World Service in another life. Uh, now I work in a call centre because I have a terrible visa. And a lot of the people that I work with are Islamophobic. And the reason they're Islamophobic is because they read a lot of dog-whistling crap on the internet in an echo chamber with people just like them. Why don't we have... I mean, the, the fact that these sources of information are so uh, uh, poor... Um, when they read something else alongside of that from the ABC, which says something else, they just they equate the two things in terms of value. Yeah. The, the, the lies are diminishing the public service broadcasting and, and media that we value. Could we, I mean, would you support a traffic light system? Green if they have three sources of information to support what they've done. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, what it's a good idea. That? But who would enforce it? I mean, you're absolutely right. I guess the, the really... Other example of that was the credence given to climate change deniers. And working at the ABC at the time, there was a lot of pressure to have climate change deniers on the radio because they were supposed to give the opposite Balance. view to empirical evidence delivered by science. So that, you know, that sort of fringe element was that seemed to be somehow valid because there needed to be... The pinnacle uh, of that was Q&A where Professor Brian Cox Malcolm debated Roberts. Malcolm Roberts. I mean, holy shit. <laughs> 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 Still recovering from that. How, how Brian Cox sat there patiently and didn't just say, are you kidding me, and walk off? I don't know. But there is a difficulty because, you know, if you're going to create a story, you know, you're going to write a story about something and it could be some Islamic issue that's popped up or some issue, and you go and interview someone and then you interview someone against and all the rest because you're trying to balance the story out sort of thing. The difficulty is, you know, that the key element of the story is conflict. So you always got one organisation that's always associated with conflict because of, that's sort of the take out of the story, even though the, the reporting is trying to provide some balance. And that's one of the difficulties, I think, in journalism. That's why so many people, you know, it's like in the PR side, just bypassing journalism because it's because of the distortion in the, the, the function of news reporting. And I, I share that one of my, the last sort of uh, gigs I did um, recently as a consultant was um, uh, with a group of imams in Victoria. I was a guest of the Victorian Police Counter-Terrorism Unit, you know. <laughs> and uh, I actually sort of got up on stage, and, and of course they'd only hire a lapsed Catholic for such a role. And uh, I sort of got up and I was actually, as I'm sort of, you know, going through my thing, I actually thought, this is surreal. This is absolutely surreal. These are the nicest group of people, well, men, I've got <laughs> you know, imams. These are the nicest people I've ever met. These are really decent people, petrified about what's happened to their community. How do you handle that? And in the end, I'm thinking, geez, I've got a heart to help. You know, why did I take this? I could have been watching television. I could have been reading The Australian, which had quite a different view. <laughs> yes. You know? but, they um, would have reported you, that uh, meeting very what, differently. What do, what do you do? You know, and um, in a situation, you know, I'm thinking, it was a few weeks, well, a few months before, there was those guys, um, you know, um, stabbed a police. And all the police officers are meant to be two up and carrying firearms. I'm like, I wonder if that guy's got a firearm. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> um, what do you do? I mean, how do these people cope? I don't know how they do it. So there's that distortion that goes on. So does it doesn't mean that the... the the, our better angels need to find a voice in the, yeah. the wider community well, and find it fast. I think and it, it also means that there's a high level of responsibility on, on getting facts correct. I mean, it's interesting that there was a survey that came out on Tuesday or so this Central week. Central Media Survey, Central yeah. Media Survey that found that 49% of Labor voters and 36% of Greens and 65% of Liberal voters, or whatever it was the numbers were, close enough, uh, supported an, a banning Muslim immigration. And just on that, they were so shocked by those numbers, they... They didn't they believe, ran it twice. They did it twice and yes, they got but, the same result. But I result. think with the, that it looks just at the surface, and I, I only have a quick glance at this, the methodology doesn't feel right. I mean, two groups of supporters, one 
very much in favour of banning, uh, uh, banning Muslim immigration, was about 20% for, for Labor, and a middle group that just kind of supported it, that was at 29. They lumped those together and they get to 49%. But that middle group, I mean, what kind of questions were they being asked? And what was the premise that was being put to them? And that's, that's where this kind of survey, which then went all over the country as a major news, news um, item, uh, and, and, and fuels the fire of One Nation and, those kind, and, their, and their supporters, uh, doesn't seem to be the most responsible type of, of, of survey. And I think there needs to be better, uh, more rigorous methodologies, more in-depth um, questions and better, you know, better processes for that but kind no, I of think information. But I think, too, we have to accept that we've got a vacuum in terms of political leadership really right across the Western world. And we've got wicked problems. So we've got climate change, which even those people who agree it exists aren't actually prepared to do anything about it. Um, so then, and then we've got uh, absolute chaos in the Middle East where, you know, how many million people? 65, 68 million people are currently displaced across the world. That's the biggest number of people since the Second World War. And so what you've got is populations who are afraid. Who feel... Oh, I think... I, no, it's back. Who, who are afraid and who feel a kind of inchoate anxiety and feel like there's nobody giving them any kind of direction. And so the media, which is also in chaos, trying to scrape up a little bit of money to keep surviving, is feeding this inchoate anxiety. So we've got a perfect storm where there are no strong voices raised uh, to give some sort of direction to the better angels. It, it, it is about leadership. I mean, you know, Malcolm Fraser, when the Vietnamese boat people came, took leadership and said, we will let those people into the country. Now, I am convinced that uh, uh, had he decided to go a different way or whatever, he could have ramped up anti-Vietnamese boat people to the extent that John Howard did and then was followed by... I mean, John Howard did that to win an election. It worked and it has continued ever since. He let the genie out of the bottle. Mm. Um, and you know, once you start to, to manipulate racism or any kind of hatred, well, you'd think we'd have learnt this by now. People think they can control it. The German finan you know, um, industrialists and financiers that supported Adolf Hitler thought they could control him. Hey, you never can. Once you let those things out... <laughs> I think we've got there's a, a question from a, a woman. Is it? Yeah. Sorry, you had yeah, and then we'll come. Yeah. Uh, um, hi, I'm Claire. I work for a digital lifestyle website that I think is probably on two thirds of the Facebook feeds in Melbourne. Um, I just want to know if the BuzzFeed news model of packaging. I guess news and politics alongside cats is something that falls under your definition of of this kind of the, like quality news or real news that we're discussing. So BuzzFeed is incredibly successful at trying to walk the tightrope, isn't it, between clickbait and and debate, so to speak. So. I think the jury's still out on BuzzFeed. There's, um, you know, they, they had a, a meteoric rise in audience numbers um, in their early early days, and they've plateaued a little bit this year. And they've reorganised their whole company around how they produce content, and it's now much more video based. There, I think, you know, time will tell. Um, they don't kind of fall into my bucket of quality media yet. That that said, they've got some pretty. Um, Is that a generational thing, though? Do you think? I read it. I, and I, I think they've got some entertaining writers. I think they do have some entertaining writers, but you know. But again, how is that different from a newspaper from 20 years ago that had its political news section, its uh, lifestyle section, its you know, um, co you know, might have had the back page full of kind of um, footy in this town, Jane. Oh yeah, but. There were newspapers, I remember them, that had back pages which were full of jokes and, you know, um, snippets of news, column eight, all that kind of stuff. I don't... See, I don't really see that BuzzFeed's formula is any different from that. It's a, got a bit of a, a whole lot of stuff. Well, yep. so did... So yep. did news media I think that, all the that, time. that's exactly right. The issue is, can they sustain it yeah. as a business? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the question we just don't know the answer to at the moment. I think uh, we have a question here. And then I think there's another one over there. And there. So we can... Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Jane Reynolds, if I can 
extend the debate slightly and talk about the concept of trust, of which media obviously plays a role, and also where on earth that edge is. Um, I spend a lot of my life both surrounded by politicians in the present day, but also reading about those and the actions of the 1890s. And I try and get people around today to actually place some importance in the role of personal relationships. To what extent do you think that we can extend trust via media and electronic forms, or is there still a role for those face-to-face -face engagements? I'll have a quick go at answering that in the first instance by saying that um, face-to-face will, in my view, not go away as an as absolutely crucial mechanism for building trust. I'll give you a quick example. I used to work in, um, in Queensland in regional media and the, the basic rule there was you couldn't, you couldn't successfully deal with anyone north of Gympie unless you went and, and actually sat in their office and um, had a cup of tea with them or even better still in Queensland, have a beer with them. Uh, once you've done that and you've built a, a, a sort of personal rapport of some sort, then they'll answer your emails and pick up the phone when you ring. So it, won't, it only works when you've got that bridge. But beyond that, the, 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 the um, ease and communication uh, tools is just fantastic. So I think both. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I've had experiences, very few, I have to admit, from journalists <laughs> ringing me for comment who have then totally distorted what I've said or printed it in the, in the right, like the words are true, but the way it's being presented makes it sound like the opposite of what I meant. Um, and I've also had a situation where a headline was changed on something I wrote which totally changed the meaning of the whole thing. And all I did was lose complete trust in those people and if they ever call me again, I will not be talking to them. And I have found myself that if you want to get access to people and you want to talk to them and you want to um, really get what's going on, they have to trust you and you have to be worthy of that trust. Uh, this gentleman up here on the, our left hand side has got a question. Hi. Um, we've seen the rise of um, uh, the cult of personality in politics. Is that also happening in media? We've got people like John Oliver making um, traditionally really boring issues like net neutrality um, really important. Um, and, and how does that work in terms of, is that the new source of trust, you know, the, the individual rather than the outlet? But is that new? I mean, I think if you look at Walter Cronkite, you know, or Brian Told Me was the advertising <coughs> campaign for Channel 9 in Sydney for years, and that was Brian Henderson. Um, I don't think anyone trusted Channel 9, but an awful lot of people trusted Brian Henderson. Rightly or wrongly, I have no idea. Um, so, I, again, I don't know that that's, that's a new thing. And I do think that satire and comedy may, along with older women, save the world. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad combination at all. <laughs> And another question just alongside. Uh, my name's Ifti. I'm a PhD student in politics in Monash. My quick question was that in social media, how does social media impact on the political landscape? Do we see uh, increasing polarization because of that? I mean, I remember in 2012, just before the last year's elections during the primaries, I was in a study tour and talking to some of the, you know, the political leaders on both sides at the state level, and they were complaining that, and that's when you know, social media was in the earlier stage, that how um, it's becoming much more polarizing. Before this, you know, they would probably be inside the chambers having a chat, talking, but now there's always is a competition that you need to uh, make the you know uh, uh, make the headlines in social media. You have to make a speech that's going to go viral, and at the same time, on your pages, you are under pressure from polarizing views on either pro or anti, and not for most of the people who are in between, who are probably much more conciliatory. So you're pushed 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 on one side or the other by the more polarizing partisan voices. So how do we overcome that? Yeah, it's a really great question because what it's done, hasn't it, it has supercharged the news cycle. So um, when you talk about Malcolm Fraser, put Malcolm Fraser in 2015 in an armada of boats coming from Vietnam and trying to make that decision as a, a strict policy decision and selling that in over a long period of time when the news cycle spins so quickly that he's probably worried about tonight, the midday news, tonight's news and tomorrow morning's news in a way that he never but, had to. But isn't that an even greater call to say, 
that politicians and leaders should therefore do the job they're supposed to do, which is to lead, not to try and make sure that they win the next election. No. I mean, Angela Merkel, I think, made a very courageous stand. Now, she's pro she may well lose the next election because of that, but I think she actually took a decision, and I think it comes directly out of Germans, Germany's past history, to approach things in a different way. Uh, I think that now the pressure is not that they're getting pushed and pulled by all this opinion. What we're looking for is leaders who go, fuck the opinion, I'm going to do what I think is right. Mm. Which is what Obama's tried to do as yeah. well. You know. yeah. I think that there is, in fact, um, those that actually... Um, there's a very good study of political leaders that have actually taken a principled stand against popular opinion and suffered or lost, um, who then come back, um, almost become unassailable in their authority and figurehead. So um, there's a very good example for having values and sticking with them, because if you betray your values, you're in, you're in a, a world of pain as a politician. You have but to be brave, though, in the face of all of that these days, don't you? Well, they do, and I think what, just getting back to that previous question about um, uh, and what's really happening, I suppose, about celebrity and clickbait and all that stuff is what you, if you look at the last election we've had, the federal election, what you're really finding is it's the... It's Brand name celebrity, you know, Hanson, Lambie, um, Hinch. You know, Hinch. Hinch, whatever. Um, I mean, Hinch has effectively gone to the federal parliament with a string of state based things he wants to do. He's in the wrong place. He's in the wrong, gone to the wrong parliament. <laughs> you know? um, anyway, no one's told him, but he's off and he's enjoying himself by all accounts. Um, but that's, that's the thing where, you know, if Ricky Muir had run as Ricky Muir's motoring, you probably would have got up, uh, because it's almost like the, those brands, Labor, Colour, they're actually quite diminishing, but in fact, what is, you know, people are looking for is almost a Kardashian style. I mean, we've been trained by this. Well, there's a really good example just happened in Sydney, and yeah. that was uh, the mayoral election for Clover Moore, who was under attack, has been under attack from the state Liberal Party, Liberal government. Um, she was a member of parliament, they changed the rules so she couldn't be a member of parliament and mayor, she stayed mayor, then they gerrymandered the election so that businesses in Sydney would have two votes and residents won. The Daily Telegraph ran a vociferous campaign against Clover Moore. Alan Jones has hated her for a decade or more and makes absolutely no secret about it. Uh, there was lots of stuff on social media about evil, wicked Clover Moore. Not only did she win the mayoral election, she got an increased vote of 10%. She increased her, her even against a gerrymander and everything else. And I think that's a really good example of a leader who has been absolutely true to herself, true to her values. And in fact, the politicians who went for her kind of overreached. They actually really annoyed the population, who, even if they didn't like Clover much, decided they'd vote for her. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an argument of politics uh, by vision as opposed to politics by numbers. Correct. The optics. The problem, and I agree, I think that's what we've got to hope to get more, to, more of, except that some of the vision that we're seeing from our politicians, certainly on the, on the, the, on the minority right. side, is... Because is, is Hanson is the politics dystopian. of vision. Yeah. Horrible vision, but yeah. nevertheless. Yeah. So be careful what we wish for. Yeah. Indeed. I think we might have room for... We're running out of time a little bit, but um, how long have we got, Tim? Five minutes. So I'll try and get a few more questions in. We'll, I'll see this young lady down the front. So we'll go there first and then we'll head to the back as well. Hi, my name's Ginny. I'm a communications officer and I'm also one of Hugh's students. Um, Jane, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned earlier that you block repeatedly and that's a, a technique that you use. And I often think about how important visibility is for women online, um, but I also acknowledge that there's a lot of dark, nasty stuff that happens out there. Um, I also think that visibility is really important for a, a historical record for women. Online um, creates role modelling for young girls. But how can women protect themselves, in your opinion? Do you have other methods apart from blocking? Or what do you suggest for young women when they speak out online, particularly on feminist issues? Uh, well, I think, I think it's really important that they do so. And I actually, I mean, I, I, I'm very friendly with people like Clementine Ford and Van Badham and stuff, and they cop the most extraordinary stuff. Um, and however, there is a lot of support for them as well. So we do have each other's backs. 
we do come in and, you know, do that thing that women always do for one another and always have when somebody did you wrong at work or whatever, you always went to your girlfriends and they sat there and told you that that person was an idiot and a bastard and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's still happening. We pass on courage to one another, which is the literal meaning of encourage. Um, I do think you shouldn't have any truck with people who are threatening and abusive. Just block them, make no apologies. Uh, sometimes, if you want to, it's good if you've got quite a few followers. I have quite a few now, and that's really helpful, because what you can do is you can retweet and block, and how that works is absolutely superb. It's a bit like when someone says to you when you're very little, I'm going to bash you up behind the shelter shed, and you turn up, but they don't know that round the corner is your big brother and all his friends, <laughs> and they're going to bash the bully up who's going to put... So the, the retweet, if you've got a lot of followers, is a powerful, powerful weapon. Um, so you can, you, know, you can use things like that. But I think it's also worth remembering that the higher the level of abuse you get, the more effective you are being. Thanks, That's man. the price for being relevant, I guess. Um, we've got another question here, then we'll come down this. Hi. Um, we've talked a lot about the quality of news being lost in like the traffic of content that we get in our news feeds and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm more interested in the kind of news that Facebook has the power for us not to see. Uh, so I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, the photo of Kim Fook, uh, the famous napalm girl, being censored by Facebook uh, recently. I mean, they did cave to pressure in the end from, like, the Norwegian press and government, but up until then. <laughs> it's a really interesting question because we talked a little bit about it when Facebook starts to editorialise and, and when it does that, it crosses a Rubicon, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, a very unfortunate example of, of one rule which was set up for probably good reason, well, definitely for good reasons, uh, applying to a, fo a photo um, in, for the wrong, uh, in the wrong circumstance. And th I think part of that problem, well, part of the issue there is that, that Facebook doesn't have an easy contact sort of list, you know, where you can make a phone call and get something changed, so to speak. It's a fairly faceless organisation, and so their methods for given um, their name, that's deeply ironic. I know, I know, <laughs> but but um, it, it just means that there's, it's harder for things for those things to be changed. As you point out, it did get changed, and um, there was a really terrific piece by the Norwegian editor who was who was uh, a Norwegian, often posting uh, um, about this whole process. Um, and uh, you know we can only hope that that well, that is a learning uh, opportunity for Facebook to actually make make more uh, more more subtle changes. Um, but that said, you know we do want those some of those protections in place for a, a, a platform that's used by a billion people a day that 16 million Australians use. Um, we don't want to have the, you know some of the the, the fully open um, but it, opportunities. But it is weird because I know a lot of breastfeeding mothers have had a very similar problem. They can't put photographs <coughs> up of themselves breastfeeding um, because they're told that it's obscene. Uh, mm. our, even women who've had mastectomies who want to reveal um, again. Mm. So that's the problem with making an algorithm, making it a blanket rule, you know, no boobs allowed. Mm. Um, Oh, well, you know, I think it should be equal opportunity. No topless men either, but notice that's okay. Um, so I think you've that not been to my Facebook. Page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean. That's the trouble with not having human beings actually applying mm. their common sense and judgment to the difference between that and porn. Oh, we've got time for one more question because uh, we are going to have uh, some drinks and uh, some refreshments out the front. I should let you know if, uh, after we finish here. So hang about for that and uh, join the conversation outside. But we'll finish just down here. Hi, my name's Xavier. Um, I'm a journalism student about to graduate in about two, three months. About to jump into this crazy industry. Um, what's your advice for a young media professional? Should it be the person who chases the truth and gets the hard facts or is it the person who does the clickbait with all the cats behind it and things like that. What's a successful media person? Well, I will say straight up, what's your definition of success? If it's just to get a job, maybe the latter, but if success is actually doing something you love and feel like you're getting reward for, it might be a longer path, but it'll certainly be more successful for you. Uh, you, you, you will, in a sense, get to define what your success is by what you, what you value. But 
Take the first job you can get offered. <laughs> because you're not so probably practical. going to get yeah. offered heaps. And there's nothing more, I'm sorry, slightly annoying than someone who's never worked in an industry before saying, well, you know, I've got to work here and not there. Um, I think when you're starting, you're learning. Yeah. And then you gain some skills and then you become marketable and then you start to decide what kind of a journalist you want to be. But I, I just think in the beginning, if somebody offers you a job, Sold yeah. with gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. Sharing cats. Yeah. Good luck. If, <laughs> Thank if you. you. <laughs> if you push, just tell them you're allergic to cats. <laughs> you're, uh... I quite like cat videos. I don't know about <laughs> anyone else. And on that note, we've come full circle. Um, can you please thank the panel? It's been a fantastic discussion. Jane Caro, Hugh Martin, Mark Civitella. Um, as I said, our next event, Thursday, the 27th of October, will be is, uh, as engaging. In fact, it's uh, free speech. How far is too far? Uh, it does uh, cover the thorny issue that you raised before of revenge porn, civility, the notions of civility in an open era of free speech and the law. So that's happening here October the 27th. Go to the uh, Bold Thinking website and um, book your tickets for that one and we'll catch you then. See you at the front. Thank you very much. Thank you.